Episode Zero, The Bard. Pierre Havelock is the sort of person people look at and think of words like arrogant, proud, aristocratic, and those are just the polite phrases used. To give credit where due, Pierre is also the sort of man who understands why others think like that. In his fifties, but not looking a day over thirty-five, a highly successful author, and quite the millionaire off the back of it. People are always jealous of those they perceive as having more. People can always rationalise their own insecurities as being someone else's, someone more important's fault. However, Mr. Havelock, OB, best-selling author, household name and millionaire, does not have it all. In fact, in his opinion, he lost it all a very long time ago, thank you very much. Not that many would actually know this. By all accounts, Pierre just appeared some few decades ago. Despite the relentless hordes of journalists, best effort, there is no proof the man even existed before publishing his first novel. No school friends, no traceable family, or even a country of origin. To all concerned parties, Pierre Havelock simply appeared one day and started writing books. Quite successful ones at that. And so, when in a flash of seemingly familiar light, a blinding white-hot glow of the very atoms of the world shifting and squirming and burning open a hole in reality, of this earth's fabric occurred, all inside Mr. Havelock's quaint little walnut wood-lined study. Pierre found himself to be most displeased, even more so when through this altogether overly generic light show that he for one would have found far too trite to have ever written into one of his books, thank you very much, when out of this miracle of the bending and collapsing and reasserting all at once of the very space-time continuum itself that oddly smelled of toast, stepped out none other than what Pierre could only have described as an anime girl, one with all the likeness of his own character creation, of that character creation. Well, it would be fair to say that as Pierre Havelock stared up from his tick leather work chair over at the young woman stepping through that blistering portal, the girl who couldn't have been far into her twenties, with bleach white hair and neat braid down past one shoulder, and a truly ridiculous night's get-up covering her from head to toe. In that moment, during his evening tea, Pierre Havelock taught only one thing. No. Just no. No, thank you very much indeed. Episode 1. The Girl. The blinding oval-shaped white light finally dispersed into a puff of plain white sparkles, returning the small wood-lined study of Pierre Havelock back to normal. Well, except for its new inhabitant. Aha! A civilian! How lovely! And one with quite the nice lodgings, I see. Good for you, sir. Now, if you don't mind, could you tell me where I am, mayhaps? Said the girl with the stark white hair. Pierre stood awestruck for only a moment before leaping into action. Before him was a woman in her early twenties at most, with some of her hair tied in a neat braid, and the rest left to hang loosely behind her shoulders, all of it completely pure in colour. She was dressed in a mixture of brown and green leather armour, the light sort that allows for one a great freedom of movement. Further, a red cape was swept across her dainty but clearly strong shoulders, and an ornate sword hung at her hip. Pierre had stood from his chair and begun to circle the girl, much to her bemusement. "'What are you doing, good sir? Is something the matter? Have you seen a phantom?' she exclaimed while turning her head around to follow the odd man's investigation. "'Silence, girl! I know that ridiculous sir nonsense. Tell me, how in God's name did you perform that light show just now, hmm? I can't see any hidden equipment,' Pierre mused, rifling through and behind his own shelves of books in search of an answer. For that matter, how did you get past the guard on the front door, eh? I swear you fans get ever more dogged. He ceased his searching and sat back into his leather armchair with a sigh, staring up at the now thoroughly confused young woman. Well, have you no answers? Are you that star-struck woman? I would begin answering promptly, girl, unless you would like me to call the police post-haste. The girl rose one of her admittedly pretty eyebrows in confusion. And what cause would you have for calling the local constabulary, my good man? You seem to be under some degree of distress. I apologise, I should have introduced myself. My name is the Lady Ardig, first knight of the land, living saint of the one church, premier adventurer on the entire continent, and slayer of the great. For a passing moment, Pierre's heart fell. His ears seemed to ring with an eerie noise. His mind raced. She's not real. This is just some stupid prank. Compose yourself, man. Enough! He stated sternly, causing a rather hurt look to come across this Ardig's face. Said face was something of note to Pierre. It was, but simply, wrong. The eyes were slightly too big and emotive, the smile and nose slightly too petite, the skin too clean and pale. That's it. She looks just like the poster. I'll admit your cosplay, as it called, is really quite admirable, but I think this little charade has gone far enough, don't you? What is it you want? Signed copy of the book? An interview? Well, spit it out, girl. 
The girl scrunched her smooth face into something of a frown. But I am the Lady Hardick. What is this cosplay you speak of? Oh, God, you're not one of those character actors, are you? The ones who pretend to actually be from the medieval societies are always the most annoying. Pierre sighed with a mild air of annoyance. But I really am. No, you are not! He had bellowed the words which abounded intimidatingly off the small words of the study. Now look here, this isn't funny, all right? I don't know how you got in here or did that whole portal thing, but you are not a character from one of my books, understand? For pity's sake, why am I saying all this? It's surely the job of your therapist to quell these delusions, no? What is a terror, Pish, sir? Pierre rubbed the fist against his wrinkled forehead in frustration. More than a little tempted to reach across for his phone and ring the police on the lunatic standing before him. All right, answer me this. If you are odd, then why do you have such pronounced assets? Hmm? The girl flushed a bright crimson shade. Rapidly taking a half step back, she crossed one hand in front of her sizable but not excessive chest and the other hand atop the hilt of her sword. How dare you, sir? You are the most scoundrel. Oh, spare me the dramatics. Fact is, your chest proves it. You would speak of a lady's bosom with such flagrant disregard? What in the son's name do you hope to prove with such depravity? The girl replied, and still firmly clasped on her weapon, face still reddening. It proves, Pierre said, his voice now more subdued and quickly growing disinterested, that you are not Arctic. Arctic was androgynous, and you are, well, most certainly a young woman. As he said the words, he pulled open a desk drawer, shuffled through it for a moment before drawing out a long tube of paper and unfurling it in front of his intruder. The girl, calling herself Ardic, blinked repeatedly, mesmerised by the thing. That's me! It would seem you are quite the artist, along with being a perverted scoundrel. Tell me, how did you draw it so quickly? And those colours! They are truly magnificent! She exclaimed, removing her hand from her sword's hilt, and instead leaning in closer to better observe the poster Pierre held behind before her. Mr. Havelock scowled, while doing his best to avert his gaze from Ardick's now, owing to her leaning forward, accentuated, oh, what did she call it? Oh, yes, her accentuated bosom. On the poster was a 2D version of the girl with the white hair, or more accurately, the girl was dressed to almost identically match the person in the poster. All right, I'll spell it out if I must. This here is a poster done by the Japanese PR team for my book. They believed using an anime aesthetic would bring in a larger and younger crowd, hence this reimagining of the Lady Arctic. However, the real Lady Arctic was not nearly so feminine. Ergo, you girl have copied a fictional character of my devising. So no matter how impressive your special effects and makeup, you can't possibly be the real Saint Arctic. Ha! The girl looked from the poster to the beaming smug-faced man holding it, completely at a loss for what he was prattling about. Pierre, however, now seemed to have completely lost interest in the girl herself, and instead become lost in thoughts of a different matter. I mean, it is actually somewhat interesting. You see, I've been studying some Japanese culture ever since we started selling the book there. Point being that the youths of Japan have this concept called the waifu, fictional cartoon women who fall, they fall deeply infatuated with. They take these characters from television programs and project all the traits they wish they could find in a man or a woman onto them. In effect, they create in their minds their idealized spouse. But in this case, Saint Hardick is an actual creation of my own devising, a character. So what would that therefore make you, hmm? An idealized sexual fantasy of my own writing come to life? I wonder if the Japanese have a separate term for... You what? proclaimed Hardick. She had now leaned back away from the poster, her face darkening. Pierre didn't bother to look up to respond. This would prove to be a mistake. Hmm? Oh, indeed, you're a waifu, yes? Well, a girl dressed up as an imaginary tart, who must snuck into my house to attempt seduction via a fantasy metaphor. Honestly, there must be more dignified ways to get an autograph from me than this. I might add your rear assets are far too highlighted in that get-up, completely out of scale with the real... <laughs> Pierre Havelock, OBE, couldn't remember the last time someone had dared strike him across the face nor the last time he'd seen someone with such an offended blush so deeply burgundy. What he did know was that never had he been hit harder in his life, and not in this current life, at least. Part 2 Pierre sat quietly on his chair, nursing his chin. The girl claiming herself as the legendary warrior, Saint Ardig, stood on the opposite side of the room, tumming through a small hardback book. It had, after being slapped across his face, struck Pierre that his comments towards the young woman, lunatic or not, might have been a little impolite, insensitive even. 
As such, he decided to take a new tact, handing to the girl the very book she was clearly grifting from. Said girl now stood perusing a few choice parts Pierre had highlighted for her. Well, Pierre asked tentatively. His jaw stung and throbbed where she had hit him, and he intended to avoid a repeat of this. The white-haired girl cleared her throat before responding. If I understand this, your wizards are scientists. Right, your scientists created this NTME contraption that allows them to look into my world, and you as a storyteller wrote these visions into this book. Pierre was forced to admit that you had picked up the basics quite quickly. Neural transmissive experience. Yes, that's the one. The machine allows us to see another world of humanoid peoples somewhere out far in the universe. And in turn, I wrote that into a book for public consumption, one which you have clearly based your costume around. A grin spread across this Ardig's face. Like all her features of her face, the grin seemed slightly off. It looked almost like the expression of a Cheshire cat, still an attractive face, but ever so slightly inhuman. Well, there you go, then. You didn't actually create me or the character about me. You simply heard people talk about me through your magic box. Meaning that the information you heard was simply inaccurate. And I am the genuine article, she announced far too pridefully. Pierre could feel his temper slipping away as his voice rose, clearly tired of this drawn-out farce. For the last time, you can't be her. What of your physical form, hmm? The girl frowned before clumsily cupping her own breasts into her hands. Pierre blushed as he averted his eyes. He suddenly felt very old. I see no reason why my form could not be aptly hidden under the right suit of armour. That's true, Pierre realised with a shiver down his spine. She always used to wear a large plate armour suit. You could hide something under that. What of your age, then? You're too young, Pierre tried. Now who's being ignorant? I'll have you know, my good man, that my family line ages slower than others. I know that. But you didn't used to age bloody backwards, he finished on her behalf. The girl frowned. And how would you know? You only have a second-hand information about me, yes? Pierre let the fists he'd subconsciously clench fall to his side and sighed. All right, then. One final test, and then I really shall call the police this instant. Ardig was the greatest mage of her time, maybe of all time. If you are her, the... The feeling of numb vertigo overcame Pierre, a lurching of his whole body, a blurring of the ceiling moving further away. In a moment, his elbows hit the floor with a heavy tug, catching him from slamming his head. He stared up at the ceiling of the study as he felt the soft carpet underneath him. What the bloody hell was that? Ardig didn't answer, but instead simply nodded at the chair before offering a hand to Pierre. He hesitated for a moment before taking it and allowing her to help him back to his feet. Soft. Her hand was so very soft and small, too soft for a warrior, perhaps. He was about to demand an explanation of the girl, but as he looked back to where his chair had once been, his eyes grew wide. The back legs of the leather chair were gone. No, that wasn't quite it. They were still there, lying next to the fallen furniture, like two pieces of firewood. On the chair itself remained only two small wooden stubs. Pierre stepped over to it, running his hands over the stubs. They hadn't been cut, there were no splinters. Indeed, it looked as though it had always been this way. The wood was flush and pristine, as if it had been never been any other way. There was absolutely no sign of damage. Pierre felt his knees go weak, wanted desperately to sit down. Behind him, the girl smiled that slightly off cat's grin once more. Slowly, Pierre picked up the stricken seat and propped it up against the wall before sitting cautiously on it, using the wall in place of its previous legs. Just, just a trick of the light. Yes, yes, that's all it is. You came here, cut the legs, fixed them back. There, there must be a cord here somewhere that you simply pulled. Yes, simple, really. As if in response, one of the two pieces of wood that had once been the chair's rear legs rose into the sky, and then it split in half without so much as a flash, then into four quarters pieces of flush wood, then eight. Before Pierre could even properly process the impossibility of this physically, the girl drew her sword. From the clean, sliding screech of the metal, the way it cut cleanly through the air, Pierre knew it was no mere prop. He braced, but it came no nearer to him. Instead, Ardig dropped it. It didn't fall. Instead, it hung in the air, as though it was held by some invisible hand or something, simply floating in midair until finally she picked it back up and sheeted it. There'd been no magic incantation, no deep concentration or wizard's wand. It had all just happened. Untenable on this planet. There, there is no magic. Completely impossible for any human. 
any from Earth, at least. Now will you finally acknowledge me, Mr. Havelock? You, you, you can't, you... Pierre mumbled, head in his hands. Speak up, man. I do not flaunt my powers so openly, just for anyone, you know. Feel honoured, in fact. You can't be her because I was dare, damn it. Pierre roared as his anger boiled over, standing out of his chair, which once more fell off balance and hit the floor with a loud clattering. The girl recessed back. Calm down, man. You were where, exactly? There, in Bolya, I was Ardig's companion. Watched her grow, watched her defend her country's borders, fight dragons and armies. I watched her become empress of the whole damn world, and then I... I... I got, well... The Japanese call it being isekai or something stupid like that. I was taken from my home, my place by her side, and placed on this godforsaken lump of dirt and sea they call Earth. I was forced to leave behind everything, against my will. To spend thirty damned years in this alien world, shunned by society, and hidden away in this house like some societal reject. And when I'd given up all hope of going home, I get this job. A job to archive the undercurrent. I couldn't believe it. Suddenly this world's humanity had proved its worth, and I had a chance to see my home again. But what do I find? The millennia had passed. I don't know how or why, but Balya, my home, has moved forward thousands of years since when I lived. My family, my friends, everything is gone, dead and long forgotten. And that, you damn harlotan, that is how I know for certain that you are not my Arctic, that you are not the person I used to know. A silence fell over the small room as the two composed their thoughts. I'll, I'll admit you must be from the same world as me and the real Arctic, as well as the same world the NTME shows, maybe even thirty years after we lived. Pierre said, breaking the silence, his voice back to a calmer tone. Your magic ability proves that you're not from Earth, but you cannot be my Arctic. You are too young, too feminine, and, well, what is your name? My name? It's Lady Arctic, the girl began. Exactly, Pierre said, drew an out thoroughly disheartened sigh, this last comment dissipating the remains of his short-lived angry outburst. That <sighs> name's the name she gained, a title. But it wasn't her actual name. How can you be her when you don't know her name, woman? The girl's face scrunched and thought. You say you knew me. You were my friend? She always used to call her companions friends in the early days. Then is it not possible you really have in your mind turned me into one of these waifus? In these past three decades you spent away. This image of an older woman who, though flattering, you have imagined as empress of the world. This person of no gender and of ultimate purity, perhaps? And now, when I have returned to you in the flesh, after all this time, I no longer match what you had painted of me in your head. The girl finished while planting one hand on her hips and gesturing with the other to the room around them, filled with books brimming with such imaginative stories. Is, is that possible? That I imagined her as different, as a form of coping with losing everything I once had? But that would mean Arctic. My sweet Arctic is standing right before me. That's not possible. I refuse to accept this. The girl shrugged, but then jumped in surprise as Pierre Havelock laid his hands on each of her shoulders. That's it, he explained with desperation rather than triumph lacing his voice. It, it would make sense if you were her daughter. The silver white hair, the powers, your age, all of it. You stepped through the portal, that, that thing, lost your memories, and to compensate your mind has filled them in with stories of your legendary parent. Ha! <laughs> that, that must be it. The girl offered the man a look of pity. At first she'd been confused at her new surrounded surroundings, then offended by his comments, but now the look of distress on his face made her feel only sorrow for the man. It was clear this drawn-out introduction was causing him quite a lot of upset. And yet in your book there is no mention of a daughter... Nor did you know of one, the girl shot back with underlying sympathy. Pierre mused on this for a moment before becoming even more pale. So, the reason the Empire's line simply ends with no records is because her daughter ends up here, in my house? And the girl simply giggled at this, actually giggled, not laughed, but giggled, in a fashion Pierre had never observed from a real-life adult before. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that, my dear fellow, for I am not my own fictional daughter. I am Ardig. My memory of how I got here is a little foggy. One moment I was at a camp with my compatriots. The next I appeared in this uh, bemoosing office of yours. But the rest of my life I can see as clear as day. Every face and every place. Just like all those in my family can. 
photographic memory, Pierre mumbled. He had by now let go of the young woman's shoulders and stood slightly swaying in the centre of the room. Y you what, memory? Oh, um, you wouldn't have had that word where you came from, but I often thought that might be what it was around in your family. Aha! So your version of Ardic had perfect memory too, then, yes? The girl purred. Pierre looked at her as though he might faint at any moment. But, but you can't be. Oh, enough of this talk already, man. Ardic huffed before perching herself atop Pierre's large mahogany desk, her sword scabbard scratching against the pristine furniture piece, her arms folded across the elegant frame of her body. And what of you? Do I not get to ask any questions in return? You say you are one of my friends. Well, which one then? Thirty years has not treated you kindly, has it? And like that, the girl Ardic began to list the names of legendary warriors that Pierre had not heard in decades, that he believed he would never hear speaking again. Warriors who could cleave the thickest trees in a single strike, mages who could atomize the very air around their opponents, archers who could hit a target whole towns away, martial artists who could defeat a platoon of armed men with just their bare hands. Five names, six, seven, eight. And then, oh, and of course, Jim Havler. He, uh, well, he doesn't have the powers and prowess necessarily of the others, but he is a very loyal man, as loyal as you could ask for, and an exceptionally talented swordsman, even with a hand tied behind his back. Indeed, the others come and go, they return to their own duties and kingdoms, but Jem has been with me for years now. That's me, Pierre uttered half-heartedly in a voice of clear defeat. No one has spoken my real name in so many years now. You? But, but just before, I found myself here and you sat next to me around the campfire, and the names and all these books you made, and... Oh, Pierre, in the sudden tongue, does that not mean precious Jem? Ardick said. Pierre nodded. And Havelock is a simple romanization of my original surname. The girl clasped her hands together in a cute and pleased understanding. I see, like a code in case others from our world ever came here. I feel the fool for not realizing all the sooner. It seems so obvious now. But still, you were there with me when I left. This time it was Pierre who shrugged. Then do you now see that I must be who I say I am? After all, if I am to stay here until you find a way to get me home, you must decide on what names to use, Ardig asked encouragingly, trying to get Pierre to cease his frowning. Pierre was silent for a few more moments. Stay here? You are my friend still, no? Or has thirty years shaken our bond so much that you would abandon me in a world I do not know, dear Jen? Would you be so embarrassed to have a so-called waifu like me as companion, at least for a time? Pierre looked into her intent eyes. Her brown eyes, the wrong colour of eyes, he lamented bitterly, and yet he couldn't deny it, that those beautiful, swirling, dark eyes were in this moment one of the most breathtaking sights he had ever seen. He couldn't deny that he had dreamed of someday being reunited with the woman he had once. The girl calling herself Arda clasped Pierre's hands in her own. Her hands are so very warm, so very soft. Apologies for striking you earlier, old friend. It would seem age has not blunted your sharp wick at wit and lack of tact, eh? Well, these may be strange circumstances we both find ourselves in, but I do hope we can still be friends in this strange new place, yes? Yeah, just stared into those brown eyes, completely at a loss. The woman smiled. Like her grin earlier, it was an almost artificial affair. A broad, kindly smile that seemed to fill Pierre with a measurable warmth. My name, good fellow, is the Lady Ardic, and you are my most faithful of companions, Pierre Havelock, no, Jem Havler, who has somehow followed me across entire worlds untold. I apologize you had to wait a little while on your lonesome for me to get her, but let me just say how very good it is to meet you once again, old friend. A wife of the Japanese call it, hmm? Made real in the image of that girl. What is this world coming to? Episode 2, Your Signature. The morning after a girl proclaiming herself to be the fictional hero of legend, Lady Ardick, arrived, was proving to be as bizarre for Pierre as the day prior had been. Finding accommodation for the woman with the snow-white hair and large brown eyes had been easy enough, 
Pierre's home in London was a large three-storey townhouse with a whole array of rooms he seldom had use for, so finding an empty bedroom for the pretend Ardic had been an easy enough task. Further, he had instructed the housekeeper to leave the girl out a change of more contemporary clothes, as well as giving the man a small bonus to keep his mouth shut about Pierre suddenly keeping a woman on the property. Now he sat in the dining room on the bottom floor. It struck Pierre, what with his mind suddenly focused on his past life, that the dining room was itself easily larger than any of his old flats had been back in his youth. That wasn't to say he'd been poor before being so rudely dragged to earth. Indeed, as a knight in the service of D. Lady Ardick, he would have been privy to accommodation fit for a captain of the guard. And yet it was only now, after all these years living in the oversized house, that he realised just how spacious the dining room by itself really was. Roof, the bottom floor of his current house was, without doubt, twice the size of the home he'd been born into. The whole house might well have been fit for a noble lord in the world Ardick came from. The exterior was a lavish wall of tall windows with interlinking exposed brickwork sections and fine work sandstone pillars that propped up quaint balconies on the second and third floors. The dining room was a long corridor shaped affair with a grand fireplace against the far wall. Said fireplace was decorated with expensive looking tools and trinkets from a great many cultures atop the mantel, alongside a fine layer of dust indicative towards a lack of use for the large hearse. The room was mostly filled with a large wooden table surrounded by twelve ornate chairs, each with fine ribbon inlays. The table was covered in lush doilies and ornate silver cutlery. Further, a small breakfast bar lay against the wall behind the table, lined with cereals, European pastries and burkas filled with tea and coffee. Pierre felt something akin to guilt run through him as he suddenly came to terms with the scale and lavishness of his home of so many years, compared with what he had left so unwillingly behind. He also felt something undeniably like annoyance at the woman sitting next to him. Beside the table being large enough for twelve, the girl calling herself Ardic had chosen to sit in the chair right next to Pierre, not across from him or at the end of the table, but right next to him. Far too close for my liking, thank you very much. Her placement right next to him created an image of two people surrounded by a ring of empty seats. She was so close, in fact, that he could smell her scent. Of course, he did his best not to, and felt guilty for it, but he was only a man after all, he reasoned. And how was he meant to react to the faint floral fragrance of someone who'd never needed makeup in her whole life to be absolutely dazzling? Her scent especially stood out considering the rest of the room, had the faint musty smell one might find in cheap hotels or old B&Bs. The girl had chosen not to wear the clothes Pierre had ordered be left out for her, instead sticking to her original fantasy night uniform, even the cape, claiming... The material of these garments was most strange, my good man, altogether too soft and coarse. I struggled to even sleep on that overstuffed mattress of your guest boudoir. Pierre hadn't argued this. He instead got a nostalgic moment of remembering his first time wearing earth clothes, and how strange their things had felt on him. A far cry from his current regime of slippered feet, warm cardigan and tin waistcoat, or his first nights on earth spent in shop doorways or police custody cells because the beds of any hostile that would take him felt alien to the touch. And this? asked the soft but excitable voice belonging to the person Pierre was currently labelling, not Ardig, as she pointed towards a large bowl of porridge. Made from oats, I believe, Pierre said back. And that one? Wheat-based. And that one with the, um, the large orange and black menacingly grinning creature on the front? Pierre rose an eyebrow at this question, before realising the cartoon brand of cereal, not Ardic, had gestured towards, Hmm? Oh, yes, maize, barley, and far too much sugar. Probably best you avoid ones like that. Last thing I need is your medieval digestive system getting a massive sugar rush. Medieval? N never mind. Pierre sighed, this conversation on the various makeups of foodstuffs and other arbitrary items around the house had been going on for quite some time now unsurprising considering Ardic's medieval origins. Not Ardic, consider Pierre's responses for a few moments before asking her next query. But do you not find it strange, Jem? Pierre. What? Call me Pierre. Jem hasn't been my name for a very long time. And besides, if someone heard that a young woman was not only living in my house, but also had some sort of private pet name for me, well, the broadsheet newspapers would be all over it. I see... The young woman mused, clearly thrown off her stride. 
Speaking of which, wherever has that young butler gone? I called for him to bring me better clothes, but he did never return. Ah, so that's what all the shouting was earlier. He's no butler, he's a part-time housekeeper. He does an hour here in the morning and the evening. Luncheon I prepare for myself, Pierre added. Only two hours a day? But how can such a thing be possible? In a house as large as this, you must surely have a whole retinue of staff. Pierre sighed again. Nope. Two hours a day is more than enough for him to keep the parts of the house I use most tidy. The rest is of little confidence. You mentioned a guardsman just last night. Not a hard dick shot back. Pierre flushed a little with embarrassment. Ah, uh, well, yes, not exactly. The whole street pays a modest sum to have a man patrol the entire thing for a bit nightly. But he, um, is not exactly my guard. The girl's face turned to a broad grin, and she poked teasingly at Pierre's cheeks, causing them to redden even further. Oh, my old friend, it seems you have not changed as much as I thought. You were always one for the crafty plans. If one cannot afford a guard on every door, then one should spread rumours to the contrary. In spreading your mistruth, you deter the least determined of would-be cap purses with words alone, yes? And all without spending a penny on guards of your own. Pierre's blush grew even deeper. Well, yes, I suppose that's the gist of it, yes. <laughs> I see your cheeks also still shine when I tease you such. They, at least, have not forgotten who I am, she cooed, poking playfully. Pierre, for his part, stood up out of his chair, brushing away the woman's soft fingertips. He strode rumpily around the long table and stood by one of the large, paned windows, running his hand through the plump red curtains that adorned it. Not Ardick frowned at having her fun stopped, before turning her attentions back to the conversation at hand. So you have no guardsmen or servants here? None at all, Pierre said dryly, his eyes now fixed on the street outside the window. No spouse or child? No cousins or apprentices for your craft? No. Nope. But isn't that awfully lonely? The woman asked in all sincerity. Pierre's hand held frozen in the air before he coughed up a response. <laughs> Some people do not mind being alone, you know. Not Ardick frowned again, deeper this time. Uh, do you still not believe I am the woman you once knew, Pierre Havelock? It was his turn to frown back at her. I do not deny you in order to cause hurt. There are simply too many inconsistencies between you and the Lady Ardic I was acquainted with. In fact, I have been considering the possibility of a, a multiverse. You know, that perhaps you're some alternate version of Ardic from the whole other... He didn't get chance to go any further with his musings, as the silver glint of a sword coursed through the air towards his neck. Up to... It had happened in a single flush movement, almost too fast for the human eye. Alt Ardic, as Pierre was now considering addressing her, had launched from her chair, used the table as a stepping stone, sending a veritable collection of cutlery and condiments astrewn, before drawing her sword in a single flourish. Said sword had gone straight through one of the red, heavy-set curtains Pierre had been admiring, cleaving the thing in half as Pierre stumbled backwards out of surprise, grabbing the slashed curtain to try and regain his balance, only to cause the remaining fabric to rip off the rails and fall lightlessly to the ground with a slick clicking sound. He wanted to ask what in God's name was going on, but he didn't get the chance. Altardic stamped forward twice in a fencing-style manoeuvre, a beaming grin across her ever-pretty face. Before he knew it, Pierre was swaying from side to side, the blade barely glancing his grey sideburns as he deftly, if a little clumsily, dodged the assault. This caused Ardic's smile to grow even larger. She ended her short assault in order to make up an expert stance, gleaming silver sword outstretched in one hand, the other held behind her back. She hopped lightly between her feet like some prized boxer might before a fight, her every movement light and controlled. What's that phrase? Move like a butterfly, sing like a bee? Well, this bee's sting is half a meter of cold, hard governor you steel! Pierre lamented internally, but this time he took action. Dashing behind himself, he grabbed up the fire poker from the mantelpiece. Like everything in the house, it was of an ornate but practical make. A long shaft of stainless steel with a heavy poker to one end and a small loop to the other. Placing his fingers through the loop, he managed to raise the awkwardly balanced staff, just in time to block a diagonal strike from his young friend's blade. Terrible clanging as the ad hoc weapon met with real craftsmanship. The hell are you doing, girl? Pierre uttered as he blocked a second slash and a third, a fourth, a fifth. The girl simply grinned ever more, a fire of excitement in her eyes. If she smiles any further, she'll run out of face. Altard had continued to press her assault, clattering down time and again against Pierre's fire poker as he desperately repelled each bro. Gradually they circled around the room, 
the girl sometimes jumping on chairs, drawing them or playing flashing the antique seats out of her way as she advanced forward with movements that seemed more fitted to a dancer than a fighter. It'd be beautiful if not so damn deadly. It is best to keep up, at one point risking a twirl manoeuvre, moving faster than he could remember in years as he spun the heavy end off the fire poker, letting it fall to the ground and freeing up the rest of the shaft as a more usable tool. More and more dents formed along Pierre's corrupted hand weapon, and he felt as though his lungs would give out and collapse at any moment from more exertion than he had been expected of him in literal decades. He didn't think of himself as an unfit man, but compared to a sword master and her prime of peak physical fitness, well, it was a contrast between them put lightly. Soon he realised that for all this to and froing, the girl was clearly holding back a great deal. Stainless steel or not, the fire poker could never survive long if she was serious. Indeed, Pierre even caught her turning the blade to its flats once or twice, as the dance continued its course. Nonetheless, the sword flurry eventually hit with force enough to buckle over the poker with a sickening screech, before with one final clanging ring, the depleted utensil collapsed in half, the broken part launching aside by the force of the slash, before lodging itself in the wall next to Pierre, with the other half falling loosely from his hands. It rose her blade's tip to Pierre's heaving chest. And then she laughed, or maybe howled would have been a better word, sheathing her sword and gripping her sides as she nearly rolled around with laughter. Pierre also clutched his sides, mostly just trying to regain his breathing. He grabbed one of the remaining upright chairs, few as they now were, and collapsed into it, sparing only the briefest of glances for his destroyed dining room. His heart was racing at a thousand miles an hour. His vision seemed almost blurry. He knew he was coated in sweat and his hands shook rapidly. There she was in the centre of his vision stood the culprit, laughing like a madman, her long silky hair swinging from side to side as she cackled, her voice is always soft but confident, a smile full of warmth brighter than any sun. What the heck was that for? Pierre stuttered through his panting. Ada looked up, wiping a tear from her eyes and finally finishing her laughing spree. She moved back to the now messy table and leant against it. Hmm? Oh, you think you were the only one questioning the validity of the other's claim to identity? Why should I have believed you were my friend Jem so easily, any more than you should believe I am Ardic, yes? Pierre stared, bemused at her. But there must have been better ways, he exclaimed, finally getting his breathing back under control. I still have my sword, nearly sold it a few times, but I held on to it all this time as proof. I, I can show you that. Other things, too. Lots of proof. The girl shook her head with a stern expression. And why do that? I've seen your collections of tat around this estate. Trinkets and toys, not relics. And of course your sword could be stolen or forged as a trick. No, my dear fellow, don't you see? The muscle memory of your body has not forgotten your style, my friend. Every strike and block you made is infinitely better than a signature written in mere pen and ink could ever be. Even with three decades of rust on you, she said with a loose wave of her hand in Pierre's direction. He just stared back blankly at her as she giggled at his expression. <laughs> there is no further questions to be had now. You are without doubt Jem Havner, the man who trained me in the ways of the sword all those years ago. And the one who was my sparring partner till, well, for me, just yesterday. Though I guess for you that was some time ago. Still, I could never forget your method. And what of you? Are you not now convinced by my sword form of who I am? Jem, or Pierre, paused for a moment before shaking his head. That style is definitely hers, but still. I'm sorry, but still no. Ardick's face fell to one of true hurt and sorrow for a moment, before brightening up again. Alas, then, very well. It was not a total failure, for I am now convinced of you, and that has given me all the more motivation to show you that I am most certainly the Lady Ardick. She said with the most ridiculous of grins once more plastered across her face. But for now, you may call me... Hmm. Call me Marka. Yes, Marka Umash. And I shall call you Pierre. That is, at least, until I convince you of who I really am. And trust me, Pierre, I will convince you. And like that, Pierre's bizarre breakfast, the first he'd had alongside another human being for quite some years, ended. Episode 3, Smooth Talker. Some people can tell when they are dreaming more than others, some even to a degree known as lucid dreaming. 
Pierre Havelock, formerly known as Jim Hamlet, is not one of these people. In fact, Pierre doesn't dream that often at all. Well, logically, he knows he must dream quite a lot, we almost all do. But despite a notepad at his bedside for scribbling down any dreams he does remember having, said notepad lays almost completely empty. Today, however, would mark the end of this. Sir Havler! Sir Havler! Where are you, man? In the faint shouts of a soft-spoken but commanding voice, Sir Havler sat atop a small wooden stool in a cramped, cheap, wood-lined room, eyebrow raised towards the others who heard this strange interruption coming from the hallway. The low ceiling door to the room flew open, and with a flourish, a few moments later, There you are! The same voice barked in through the door and strode across a woman in her early twenties, her hair a beautiful shade of chestnut brown, flowing behind her shoulders as her red-tinted eyes stared intently at her prey. Havler rose his youthful but calloused hands in some sort of faux surrender. Here I am indeed, my lady. Is something the matter? The young lady scrunched her face indignantly, glancing around the room to observe her audience of four. Aside from the cheekily grinning face of Sir Havler, she was also greeted by the rest of her current travelling party. Her manservant, a small sheepish slip of a man with shaggy blonde hair, Second, a monstrously tall woman with a ridiculously large broadsword affixed to her back. And finally, a more regular-sized man with a hairline covering over his eyes and a bow of the finest making by his side. The lady hesitated for a moment on whether to continue with this captive audience watching before speaking once again. <laughs> what I want to know is why exactly you have been transpiring behind my back, in contact with my father, no less. Havelay frowned a little at this assertion, simply shrugging his shoulders. To his side, the tall woman sighed ruefully. What have you done now, Sir Havler? I really don't know this time, the man himself tried to say before being once more rudely cut off by the girl with the beautiful hair. Don't know, hmm? Then I shall read it right now, the letter I found in your quarters, no less. Ha! And with that she began to read from a piece of letter-sized parchment in one hand. To your grace, my king, I write only in response to your own letter to say that perhaps a story is in order. It is no doubt true that one does not fix the finest diamond to the sharpest weapon, that such precious stones are to be made permanently beautiful, with in jewellery, or at the very least made into such fine weapons as to be hung upon a wall in the court of royalty. Indeed, one does not pluck the single beautiful blossoming flower from a barren field carelessly, and no doubt your daughter is the most magnificent of flowers, the most shining of jewels. Well, Havler, what say you in your defence of this, you traitorous scoundrel? The woman finished, her face a picture of hurt and betrayal from the dramatic reading of the words. To her side, the young manservant with the moppy hair, and in close to the bowman with the permanent scowl. I do not understand why our lady is so mad. Was he not complimenting her? The boy asked. The bowman laughed crookedly in response. <laughs> Perhaps, but it was not his words that have offended her, but their meaning. The king wishes for our lady to cease her adventuring ways, and now our resident knight offers his highness license to demand her return by recommendation of her own retainers. He exclaimed with a questioning glance in Sir Havler's direction. Rather than inform excuses, the so-called knight simply shrugged a second time. I meant no harm by it. May I ask, have you read the back yet, my lady? The young woman, still standing in the low doorway, slowly turned the tin parchment around to reveal further writing. Somewhat more quietly, she began to read from it aloud, her face going from one ready to further chew out her servants to one of abject embarrassment. And yet, my lord, although it may not be my place to say as such, does the craftsman who constructs such jewellery not need tools of a higher brand? Is not a chisel tipped with the finest diamond needed to make true ornaments? Are the strongest blades and arrow tips not forged from those strange, same, rarest of metals? The very sword by my side, as gifted to me by your highness on the day of my royal oath, is it not made of the rarest of all metals, Magite? Is it not therefore so that your daughter, greatest of blossoms, is also capable of being the greatest blade? Is it not then that I beseech my lord not to further proposition me to speak with your daughter? For my lady, who stands the lone blossom in the barren field, must surely be the most beautiful and most deadly of all weapons. And I doubt if any man, you or I, could ever temper that most magnificent of edges. As she finished reading the last words, the young lady's face caught a light in a flush of bright crimson hotter than any sun. 
I had left that on my table, out of indecision, my lady. If my words were too vulgar, I feared they might trouble your father into further harshness towards you, on accord of my possible arrogance, Sir Havler said with a loose wave of his hand. The lady stared down at her feet in silence, the other three occupants of the room clapping, half sarcastically and half in earnest. <laughs> That's our Sir Havler for you. What can you expect from a wannabe storyteller? laughed the tall woman. Quite the smooth talker, isn't he? sneered the bowman. I, I think it's sweet, half muttered the also blushing manservant. Sir Havler hopped to his feet and began to make his way over to so the still silently blushing woman. His hand reached for her shoulder. I hope I haven't upset you, my lady. I apologise if it seems in any way crass what I have said. Pierre sat up in his bed, slowly rubbing the sleep from his eyes. It had not been a nightmare or a sudden awakening. Now instead the light of daybreak flooded gently through the half-open curtain, and a small bird chirped playfully on the windowsill outside. He reached over calmly to his notepad and began to write down the details of the dream. Did that actually happen years ago, or was it a confused memory? He lamented, trying to write down all the details with haste. I haven't had a dream about my time with her in, in years. What was she wearing? Arding, what was she wearing, for God's sake, man? Her, her hair, yes. Her hair was definitely brown and her eyes red. That, that much at least is clear. What was she wearing? Was she pronounced? Or did she wear heavy armour like Maka suggested? Could the dream be affected by Maka's presence here? Could my memories be changing? bending around her. Trying to remember dreams is a funny thing. The more you try to force it, the more they seep away, like attempting to cup water in your palms. An old quote of Harold Pinter's about the fallibility of memories floated unwelcomingly across Pierre's mind. He tapped his pen against the paper impatiently, attempting to squeeze out as many details as possible, as many as could give him clues towards the girl calling herself Marka, the girl currently living in his house. Yeah, Pierre, I mean! You're late for breakfast. You coming down? You promised we were going to walk today, my good man. R remember? A kind and warm voice from another room in the house. Pierre sighed, laying down the notepad with barely a line or two written in it, the dream now dissipating like smoke. Then again, it had also been years since anyone had called him for breakfast. Maybe it's not so bad having her hair after all. Episode 4. Valentine's? Is that some sort of tank? After the excitement of the prior two days, Pierre decided a calm and composed walk was in order, and so on the girl's third day of staying at his townhouse, they set off on just such an expedition. For his part, Pierre donned a heavy trench coat with the collars turned up, a pair of sunglasses on his face, and a wide-brimmed hat atop his head, all in a probably vain attempt to keep his identity secret from the public. The girl who had appeared two days prior declaring herself the legendary hero Ardig while dressed like some cartoon character had eventually been convinced to try earth clothing, removing her cape for a beige coloured frock coat and choosing a rather pretty straw hat to contrast nicely with her white hair. They made their way through the quieter parts of London, as quiet as one can hope to find in a city of nine million, stopping at a deli to buy a hot breakfast, which Marker predictably asked all sorts of questions on before making their way to a relatively secluded park. The area was a large clearing of green encircled by a gravel path that at other times of the day was populated by joggers and dog walkers. The children would run about on the grass. However, early in the morning of a crisp Thursday in February, there were few about. A few branches dotted the place, along with a black and grey fish and chip van. The place smelled only slightly cleaner than the rest of the city, with the whitewashed buildings and skyscrapers of London not far off in the distance. A flock of ducks made their way noisily up a nearby stream, and the white fluffy clouds of the chilly day passed by peacefully above. It was, Pierre mused, incredibly tranquil of a place, and he found himself wondering why he did not frequent it more often, considering its easy walking distance from his home. Maka too seemed to be enjoying herself as they walked along the gravel path, looking out at the scenery, her cheeks taking on a faint rosiness from the cold air brushing against her face. A point of consideration for Pierre was just how easily Maka was taking everything in. He remembered back to when he had first arrived on Earth, surrounded by hundreds of metal, horseless carriages, illuminated by a myriad of artificial streetlights and barely speaking a word of the language. Maka, by comparison, just seemed curious about cars and cereals, 
about the internet and the strange metal blocks of phones all the youths seem to spend their time buried into their faces, and while all, mysteriously speaking, perfect English from the very moment she'd arrived. Indeed, Maka asked a great many questions, including ones that Pierre would have liked the answers to himself. My good men, tell me, they have coffee here, tea too. Further, although they go by different names, many products here are made by the same crops as those of our homeland. Maize, barley, wheat. Do you not find that strange? Pierre grunted. He had been expecting this question sooner or later. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have the answers to that one, he sighed. Maka elbowed him gently in the ribs. Well, of course not. You are a storyteller, not a researcher. But surely the scientists who employed you to write your book on the so-called undercurrent have investigated these oddities, these similarities between Earth and our homeworld. I'm afraid not. See, the machine they use to see your world translates things into what humans can understand, like the language. They believe everything is just translations. They don't even realize that people on Balia drink something called tea. They think it's just another drink that's brewed or something similar. In fact, the researchers aren't even sure the people of the undercurrent are human. Maka frowned in response to this. I dare say, Chair Pierre, we are both quite as human as anyone else I have seen here. Further, are we not speaking the same language? Pierre chose against probing Maka on the fact that they were speaking English, deciding it too much of a headache to follow up in that moment. Yes, we are human, but they don't know that for sure. Like how they don't know you had tea and coffee back in Balia. But why haven't you told them, silly? It could be key to getting us back home. Maka laughed, as though stating the blindingly obvious. Pierre frowned. Oh yes, me, the guy writing the archive of the experiments. I'll just walk in and say, by the way, I'm actually from Balia myself. And we're not tree-eyed green bug monsters, thank you very much, shall I? At best, they'd think it a publicity stunt. At worst, they'd send me to a psychiatrist. Marcus seemed to accept this answer as, absent-mindedly, they rounded the corner of the gravel path, nearly back to where they had started. The previous conversation being at something of a cul-de-sac, Marcus decided to try a new angle. I was pursuing the internet last evening. You were doing what? The internet, Pierre. You know, the flashy plastic screen strewn throughout your homestead. That is the most dangerous place to be, woman! Maka grinned deviously at this, leaning in close to Pierre. Oh, yes, is it now? And why ever is that? Pierre receded back, trying to avert his gaze. She was close enough now for him to hear her breathing and see the faint clouds of breath against the cold morning air. Because you, you, you might come across information, yes, on yourself. Things that haven't happened to you but were in my book. And that might affect the, the space-time continuum. But butterfly effect and, and all that. You what? Maka giggled, ignoring Pierre's gibberish. <laughs> Enough prattle, man. I have a question. There was one of those autonomous herald peddling wares online for something called Valentine. What is a Valentine? It was Pierre's turn to grin mischievously. Why, a Valentine is a tank, a sort of mechanical battle carriage adorned with weaponry. They were used during a conflict in this world called the Second World War. More than 8,000 were made, you know. Most concentratedly deployed in the North African campaign. Though amazingly, they were still seeing some use up until the Cyprus conflict in 1963. That's during what this world calls the 20th Sen. Marco was staring. Staring absolute daggers of fire into Pierre's soul from her walking pace beside him. He thought for a passing moment she might even draw her sword on him again, and was relieved to remember he had begrudgingly made her leave it behind. You jest, do you not, Mr. Havlerk? Marcus said, still glaring. Pierre drew up his hands in defeat. All right, all right. No, it isn't a lie. There really is a tank called. Get to the point already, man! Pierre relented and explained the basic outline of the holiday called Valentine's Day, and its general history as he understood it. You know, it's actually a little ironic. In the modern day on the current, a feast day in honour of you, St. Arding's Day, is something of a hybrid cross between Earth's Christmas and Valentine's, depending on the countries you visit. Did you just say you, Pierre? Yes, Maka cooed. Pierre looked away, quickly realising the verbal misstep. Did I? Well, you know what I mean. Not you exactly, like a, a royal you. Marka frowned, mumbling under her breath. So you would still deny my identity? Before perking up again. As of course, you will be my valentine for this occasion, yes? 
Pierre flushed bright red, nearly falling as he tripped over his own feet. Maka half grabbing his shoulder to keep him upright. You, 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 of course not Valentine's, it's for children, not adults. Maka grinned broadly at this reaction before covering it with a playful pouting expression. For children, eh? We shall see Pierre have luck, if I cannot tempt you yet. Pierre nearly fainted on the spot. Episode 5, To Have a Legacy Against Pierre's better judgement, walking through the quieter parts of London and to the small park near his home had become a daily activity. At first he had taught Marka Wood, after his initial tour of the area, be able to go on as many walks as she liked by herself, but that had proved not to be the case. It was far from a question of security. Pierre had full confidence that even without her sword, Marka's magical abilities and sheer skill in hand-to-hand -hand combat would be more than enough to protect herself from any potential mugger or would-be murderer prowling the city streets. No, instead, every day the girl would find some new reason to drag Pierre along. And for his part, Pierre found he didn't really require all that much convincing. And so flew past the days into the better part of a week, since Marka had suddenly appeared through the portal of blinding white light in his humble study. Today, Marka's excuse had been wanting to see the city in dusklight, and so the two had set out a bit later in the day. This combined with the seasons beginning to change, and it was much warmer outside, and the young woman took a great interest in all the new plants beginning to think about sprouting, or the trees reclaiming their fallen leaves. When Marka's avert eagerness finally started to settle, they chose to sit on one of the park benches they seemed always to pass by, in order to give Pierre a breeder. The one with the gravel track around its circumference, the green where the children now played football in the early evening light, and where the grey chip van that seemed to have permanent residence in the place was. The bench they chose was on one side of the food van. To its far side was another bench where two teenagers, a boy and a girl, sat speaking, but far enough away that they could not be overheard. Pierre liked to make sure that people were not listening to his and Mocker's bizarre conversations. For her part, Marcus sat contentedly eating from a brown paper bag of chips they had bought from the van. Pierre had been glad that for all her odd similarities, Marcus did not eat like an anime character. He'd seen some clips of the so-called waifu eating, and quite bluntly the strange way they took small bites of food before smiling in pleasure downright creeped Pierre. Indeed, he was glad Marcus ate food like a normal person. He himself had opted against getting anything, somewhat concerned that his diet had been compromised by his time with Marka. She herself did not seem to share this worry. So, listen, I've been reading your book, and I have questions, Marka said in between mouthfuls. I'm on the fourth arc. The fourth? Are you skim-reading or something, woman? Pierre asked in true surprise. He had been against Mark even looking at the tin till just a couple of days ago. Marka finished eating for a moment. I've always been a fast reader, my dear man. You can put that down to your uh, engaging prose. She smiles sweetly. <laughs> engaging prose, my arse. You shouldn't even be able to speak English, never mind binge reading it. Anyway, my question is in regards to our current circumstances. To be clear, roughly 30 years ago, you were taken from our world and er, uh, uh, isekai to this world, yes? Pierre nodded his agreement. Then, almost two years ago, 28 since your arrival, the Earth researchers discovered a way to look back into our world, which they dub undercurrent, in much the same way one might look through a neighbor's house's window. Odd analogy, but yes, I suppose, Pierre said with another nod. Marka smiled in self-gratification as she continued on. To your horror, you looked through this window, only to see the world had advanced thousands of years since your departure to a point where the horseless carriages of this world seem like nothing. Now your home is packed with metal boats that fly through not just the sky, but space. And humanity rides atop giants that give battle against one another in the very heavens themselves. So I ask you, Pierre, my dear fellow, could it be that you not only travel through space, but also at uh, time to the future above Earth and the undercurrent? Yes? Pierre sighed. He had contemplated thoughts like these for years now, but it was certainly strange hearing them coming from another person. And I take what you're getting at, is that if I was randomly transported to time and space, from one place to another, then you could have had the same happen too, that about it. Maka took this as her turn to nod in confirmation. Exactly. If time and the place are randomly picked, 
and that would explain why I arrived here thirty years after you did, but no less about my history than you do. Like when we met, you claimed I was Empress of the World, yet in my time I'm only the heir of a small nation, see? Pierre massaged his forehead patiently. Yes, but that's exactly it, isn't it? When I left you, you were already on your merry way to conquering the known world. So how can you be here now before you've done that? The version of me you claim to have left behind, by all rights, still must end up here. Ergo, he needs to have the same memories as me, or it becomes some sort of paradox. Ha <laughs> ha, my dear Pierre, perhaps not. Imagine, if you will, that I disappear into this world, spend some time with your current you, and then return again. As long as I don't tell anyone what happened, what's to say they would know any different? Then I could still become the empress, and younger you could still get sent here. Pierre frowned as he turned this idea over in his head. I suppose, were it not for other inconsistencies in your appearance, that might, theoretically at least, be possible. However, I doubt it. And why is that? Mocker returned indignantly. Look down the pathway for a moment, would you? Pierre said, pointing along the gravel track a few paces in front of them. How much time would it take to get from here to its corner? Mocker frowned. Eh, maybe thirty seconds at a light pace? Why? Because, while you could measure the path in metres or feet or yards, time, although more variable, is also a measurement. Therefore, I believe Balia or the undercurrent and Earth are two planets in the same universe. I have long held that when I moved from one planet to this Earth, the time it would have taken to physically make that trip was added on. In essence, it seems to me that to get from Earth to Balia would be a trip of thousands of miles in length, or, if we were measuring it in years, thousands of doughs. Hence why time had moved so much when I arrived here. It's like if I suddenly teleported from this bench to the corner of the footpath without walking, but with thirty seconds of time still having passed. Marka laid the bag of chips she had still been picking from down on her lap, and rose a hand to her chin in contemplation of these admittedly somewhat advanced concepts, especially advanced for a woman from an age where the catapult or crossbow was still the pinnacle of technology. Her face had a habit of scrunching up slightly when in thought. Her forehead wrinkled ever so mildly in a fashion Pierre couldn't help but think was a little cute. So, she said finally, breaking her ad hoc meditation on the matter, in order for me of my current age to be here, I would have arrived a couple of years before you did. Pierre nodded, but kindly a look overcame his face. Absent-mindedly, he laid a hand atop Marcus' silky white hair and ruffled it playfully. Good effort, though. I appreciate the torch you put in. I dare say a lot of people from this world wouldn't have understood half of what I just said. He finished with a surprisingly warm laugh and happy smile, which Marco reciprocated with a laugh of her own. All right, then, I have another question, she said, still smiling. This time Pierre didn't sigh or moan in protest. If anything, he seemed happy at the easy air of the conversation. Go on. In the book, one of your characters claims his middle name is Havelet. That's the eldest child in his family is always given that name, based off some ancient hero, right? Pierre's smile broke a little as Mocker continued. Now obviously he can't be your direct descendant or anything, after all, thousands of years passing and all that. But what if he's really a distant relative of your sister's? I mean, when we first met, you said there was nothing left in the undercurrent to prove you or your family had ever existed. But with this, in your own book, is a character with your name. If it's true, that would make your great-great-great, uh, well, a lot of greats, nephew, a great legacy, yes? My sister. Yes, my sister, my, my family. When did I last think about her? Writing the book, I guess, but, like, really think about her. What happened to her after I left? Did she leave a good life? Was she happy? How could I, how could I not think about something like that more seriously? How could I forget my own family? To. Well, unless you just put it in there for fun, Maka continued to muse at Pierre's side. For fun? Pierre asked, his voice strained a little as his mind found itself preoccupied. Maka nodded. Yeah, I read on the internet, and don't say it again. I know you think the internet is haunted by degenerates, or something, but thus far it seems like a most amiable place. Anyhow, I read some writers like to project themselves onto their stories, or include characters based on themselves. How many years since you really thought about them? About your family. Remember how happy everyone was when Sis settled with that nice man? Not a soldier like me, liable to go off to war and never come back. 
and instead a good man who could protect his family and respect them. A stable blacksmith's job. Yes, a good man for a wonderful woman. They, they were expecting a child when I got transported to Earth, weren't they? A baby. I never saw a niece or maybe a nephew. Father must have been so ecstatic to become a grandparent. Pierre continued to think to himself, barely registering what Mark had said. What? No, girl! I did not self-insert myself into my own book. What do you take me for? It is a historical archive of a scientific study for public consumption. I simply wrote what I saw, and the Havlin mentioned could be anyone. The name was common enough. It could refer to someone who heroically saved a child from a burning building or cured a town of some deadly disease. I highly doubt it has anything to do with me, thank you very much. Pierre stated with an uncomfortable tone overcoming his voice. Marcus's face became coloured with concern. Oh yes, I, I suppose that could be true. I, I didn't mean to offend your writing. It's just, uh, what about the mention of the girl? Ha! More coincidences. That creature could have been one of thousands. It proves nothing. Pierre shot back, cutting off her sentence dismissively. Marco went to lay a hand on Pierre's forehead, where he plastered across her body language. Are you feeling okay? You almost sound like you don't want a legacy. A lurching feeling crept around Pierre's body, a sickening in his stomach, a dryness in his throat. His mind felt the familiar sensation of vertigo as his emotions began to swirl. It was as though Mocker's talk of family had hit a trigger, a switch of repressed feelings and emotions, things he had dealt with, thirty years of pent-up regret and remorse. How easy is it to forget a face? I mean, if you don't see an old friend for ten years, you might remember the standout moments, their name, Maybe even their favourite foods, but their face. The subtle contortions of a smile on a happy occasion. The slight swelling of their expressions during a tear-filled funeral. The flush of their cheeks on a first date. How many years does it take to forget the face of your own damn sister, man? Pierre harshly slapped Marcus's hand away from feeling his forehead. He glared into her hurt-filled eyes. What do you care how I feel, or whether I have a legacy or not? Pierre, I, I don't understand. Who are you, woman? A ghost? A dream? The restless spirit of someone I wronged? Hmm? What are you? Who are you? Weren't right of you to turn up out of nowhere like this and pry into my so-called legacy? He spat. Maka laid her hands on her lap and sat up straight, trying for a calm demeanour as she spoke. I, I am the Lady Arctic, your friend. But it's okay if you don't want to call me that. We chose the name Maka together, remember? I like it a lot, okay? But no words seemed to reach Pierre now. All the confused emotions that boiled inside him seemed to focus on the young woman before him, a focal point for unwarranted anger. But you're not, are you? See, I started to think you were, started to believe maybe you were right, maybe my memories were wrong, because that's the thing. Memories, dreams, they can all change, shift, be manipulated. What if I really had imagined a perfect woman in my head, which you was the actual, real version of the girl? But then I thought further, and just now it clicked. <laughs> I'm ashamed I didn't see it sooner. Yeah, please calm down. No, it's your turn to be quiet and listen to me, you damn harlotin. Pierre half roared, loud enough for others in the park to turn and stare. Science! <laughs> Science! My memories might all be wrong, but not the scientific facts of the matter. Why are your eyes not red? Marcus's face seemed to freeze for a few moments, as though everything inside her had stopped for a couple seconds. See! See, there it is! Your hair is white and your skin fair, all because of your abilities. Magic you overused, but your eyes, they should be red. All magi gain a faint red tinting to their pupils, so faint you might not even see it. But you, before your hair goes white or your skin turns pale, your eyes always go fully red first. And yet, you, with your stupid white hair and your alabaster skin, have brown eyes. It's not my memories misremembering your eye colour, but that you are scientifically impossible. As his ramble ended, Pierre grabbed Marker harshly by the wrist, yanking her close to his face before using his other hand to hold open his own eyelid. Pierre, that hurts. Please, shut up. Look in my eye. Faint. So very faint because I had so little esper ability. But it's there, eh? A faint red rim. It's been staring at me. The answer this whole time in every mirror and every dream. Red eyes. You do not have red eyes. Reluctantly, Maka nodded. You wouldn't see it without focusing. But around the rim of Pierre's eyes was the trace of red. And yet yours are completely brown. No messed up memories or, or imaginary bloody waifus. Just science. That you are not my Ardig. 
So then who the hell are you? Why did you appear in my home, sauntering around like you own the place, breaking my best armchair, wrecking my dining room, causing everyone on the street to start talking about Havelock's young mistress? Marka pulled her wrist free from Pierre's continued grasp, faint red mark forming from the strength of his grip. She stood silently up from the small park bench. Pierre, you said once that some people like being alone. Is, is that what this is? Do you want me to leave you? I am not your plaything to tease and take advantage of. What I want is simple. Tell me who you are, was all Pierre would say back. Marka turned her face aside, visible tears welling in her eyes, her bruised wrist clutched against her other hand, both pressed against her chest. Oh, I think, I think I should go now. I'll be at the house, if it is still our house. I can find my own way back. And with that she began to walk away, not stopping to look back at Pierre. For his part, Pierre slumped back onto the bench, Marcus' departure seemingly causing all the built-up rage to dissipate in an instant. He stared up at the sky at ugly grey rain clouds forming on the horizon, and he evaluated his own sudden outburst, evaluating the feelings he thought he'd abandoned decades ago, evaluated the way he'd just spoken to Marka. Episode 6, Pierre and Mocha, Part 1 After their disagreement in the park, the rest of Pierre's day proved altogether more sombre. Upon returning to the townhouse, he found Mocha had retreated to her bedroom, choosing not to leave it for the rest of the evening. Indeed, at dinner time he ate in abject silence, in the now somewhat repaired remains of the dining room that just days ago him and Mocha had first eaten breakfast in. In the later hours of the day, he sat quietly in his study on the old leather armchair, which had now been partially fixed after Mocker's destruction of it when she had first appeared. Usually she would join him in the study, sitting on a small wooden stool as she read books or made jokes distracting him from his actual work. But tonight the small wood-lined room was silent, but for the ticking of the wall clock. Eventually night drew in and Pierre made his rounds of the large building, turning out all the lights for the evening, with only tin streams of the exterior street lamps lighting the house's large rooms. At that moment the old building felt very... empty. As he reached his own room, a small enough affair next to his study on the third floor, he couldn't help but feel the walls seemingly swallowing him claustrophobically as he struggled to fall asleep. You can't go, grumbled a truly graveled, inhuman voice. Let me go, Golem! That's a damn order, you hear? Let me go! yelled the man's voice back desperately. Jim Havler, the owner of the voice, struggled restlessly against the large, round and stone-crafted arms of the Golem. The creature was one of the many new travelling companions him and the Lady Arctic had recently gained. There were others, the jester-like man who was a whirlwind of daggers in combat, the young magi woman who kept claiming to be Arctic's apprentice, though Arctic herself fiercely denied this, the golem itself, a hulking, almost eight-foot mass of rock and mortar with two hollow flaming eyes and strength enough to match its imposing appearance. In all, there were now ten in Lady Arctic's travelling party, a far cry from the days when it had just been her, Jem, and, or even when it was just the five of them. Of those ten companions, seven now lay dead around Jem's feet. Yes, it had definitely been many years since that carefree day when Ardic had taught Jem was conspiring with her father to stop their adventures. How they had all laughed back then, and how the sword master, legendary archer, and even the loyal manservant who had all been there that day, all were dead alongside their newer party members here on the field of battle. It had happened suddenly, word from the king that an invasion force five or ten thousand strong was on the borders. Ardic's group had arrived to reinforce the battle lines, and for a time it had worked. Around each of Jim's fallen comrades lay a dozen or even a hundred corpses of enemy soldiers, men stabbed with their own spears, others with arrows easily piercing through the cheap armour of frontline footmen, some burned to a crisp by magi abilities, or slashed in the neck by throwing knives. But ten people, adventurers or not, can only do so much against an army of thousands. What is a hero against the military? And so, one by one, they had fallen till they were just three. Jem, who stood clutched in the golem's firm grip, his side bleeding profusely, and his left arm at an odd angle from broken bones. The golem, missing large chunks of its brick construction, barely enough left to stay standing upright. And finally, the third member their great leader and mistress, St. Ardic herself. 
She stood a little ways ahead of Jem and the golem and the corpses of the dead, atop a small, slightly scorched rise in the land, a red cape and brown shoulder-length hair fluttering in the strong winds against a backdrop of the setting sun. In the air, the heavy smell of trodden dirt, the metallic scent of blood and bodily decay. In front of her, two things, a cacophony of screams and a typhoon of gleaming swords. The swords flew through the air as though being held on marionette strings, reflecting brightly against the sun as lines of light darting all across the skyline, like tiny bolts of white lightning. It was impossible to tell if there were a hundred of these blades or a thousand as they danced across the battlefield in front of Ardig. They cut and sliced and maimed and sawed and stabbed and struck again and again and again. The army before Ardig, thousands of men just below her on the far side of the little hill, fell one after the other. Men desperately grappling over the corpses of their own deceased friends, others tumbling backwards, piling the bodies two or three high. Scream after scream, slice after slice, the swords danced through the sky, mercilessly killing man after hapless man, as though they had minds of their own, Ardig's powers pushing to its greatest extreme as she simply stood there, atop the little hill watching, willing the swords to fight on her behest. One hand rested against a single stationary blade planted into the ground before her. He go to her, damn it! Jim roared, trying to break free of the golem's hold on him. My commander, your power has been calculated as inferior to those around us. The golem rumbled flatly, almost in monotone. Inferior? Are you saying I'd just get myself killed if I tried to help? The golem looked around itself for the other fallen adventurers of the party, then down at Jem's wounds. We cannot help her now. You cannot help her now. Jem eased his struggling, staring up at Ardig's silhouette as tears formed in his eyes. He knew it was true. He knew he was by far the weakest member of the group. If the others were gone, then he could surely do nothing but get in the way. Yet still... Something new caught his eye, all amongst a storm of blades in front of Ardig. Her hair. At its tips, the brunette was beginning to change colour, to grey out, then whiten. Oh God, she's pushed too far! Abused her power too much! Jem exclaimed, mortified. Slowly, as the screamers of battle continued, the young woman on the hilltop began to change. Her skin grew paler and her hair, all of it now, began to turn. A few more minutes later, and at last it ended, as quickly as it had started. Ten thousand or more men lay dead, piled in mounds of their own rotting comrades. Standing above this massacre, like a sentinel, was the Lady Ardig. Her hair a mesmerising pure white, her skin alabaster, her eyes deeper than ever before, an abyssal crimson red. It's over. The swords fell lifelessly from the air, back to the ground as the chunks of unearthed metal they began as. Ardig collapsed to her knees, supporting herself with both hands wrapped to the hilt of her final blade her hair and cape still blowing in the wind, as silence finally settled over the scene. Then, one last scream broke through the air, one more soldier rose from the endless mounds of dead, charging up the hill with a weapon raised overhead, and a deep, frightened revenge in his eyes. Jem moved fast, the golem finally releasing him. He grabbed his own blade, ran straight past Ardig's crouched form, and in a single flourish, a movement in one hole, cleaved off the final attacker's head. Now it's over! Glancing around to look for any other enemy survivors, playing possum, Jem spotted Ardig smile her thanks for the last minute rescue before falling over completely. He ran to her side before skidding to prop her head against his lap before it could actually hit the ground. Her eyes, her now deep red eyes, fluttered open. Nice save, old friend, she grinned. Ha! That's rich coming from you! I think my one kill will struggle to match your count for the day. Jem laughed hoarsely with little mirth brushing some of the pitch-white hair out of Ardic's eyes. Don't try to talk now. You're injured, and that was bloody stupid, you know, using your ability like that. Ardic smiled again, raising a shaky hand up to caress Jem's cheek. Are the others okay? Jem swallowed hard, considering his response. But then something else unexpected happened. Ardic's hand fell limply to her side, her eyes suddenly rolling shut. Ardic? What's, what's wrong, Ardic? Jim looked up, searching for help, but there was nothing, literally. Around him it was all gone, the corpses of friend and foe alike, the golem, even the sunset. He stared down at the girl on his lap, reached for her wrist, her pulse. It was gone. No! No, no, you can't! You, you can't die here! Someone! Anyone! There was no reply. The very ground seemed to have vanished. Jim found himself in an endless void with only Ardig and himself left. A dead Ardig. No! No, no, no! 
This isn't how it happened. You you abused your powers, but you lived through it, right? You you don't die here, Arctic. I remember you living through this battle. Arctic, Arctic, please, please don't leave me alone again, not again. And then even her newfound corpse began to fade away to a place he knew he could not follow. Pierre jutted awake in his bed, the pale light of the moon outside his curtain. He did not bother trying to write this dream down. He could remember it all vividly, and he knew it was false. Yes, a nightmare. I was there. She survived that day, became the, the sword dancer or sword slayer or whatever they call it. Yes, exactly. Pierre suddenly rose his hands to feel his face. He was wet with an outpouring of tears. <laughs> I'm crying. Why the hell would I cry over a, a silly little dream, a nightmare? I don't... I don't want to be alone again. Part 2. Sweat trickled across Pierre's face, mixing with the quickly drying tear stains. He reached to the bedside table for the tissue box, cleaning the mess as best he could in the half-light. That didn't happen. I was there, and that didn't happen. I'd used her powers to their max, causing a change in her body. And that was it. She beat the army of ten thousand, yes. Then she, she began her conquest, right, yes. Her conquest, empress of the world and all that. Pierre muttered to himself, the bizarre nightmare still lingering in his mind. I don't... I don't want... The words caught in his mouth. He was an adult, after all. A grown man. Men don't cry over bad dreams or get lonely. In a sudden movement, Pierre threw back the covers of his bed and sprang out, wearing nothing but his felt pyjamas, and only briefly stopping to grab a torch, he swung open the bedroom door. Quickly, he felt his way around the third floor's narrow corridor, not wasting time on the light switch. He made his way round for the banister of the old staircase. Finding it, he began his slow descent, the feeling of soft carpet beneath his bare feet being complemented by the creaking of each step, the long winding steps illuminated only by the spare torchlight. Finally, he reached the second floor and strode over to one door in specific. He hesitated only a moment, staring down the long, eerily empty corridor before knocking. But before he even finished that, the door swung open by itself. She's not here. Inside was Ardick's room, or marker. The bed covers lazily rolled back and no inhabitants. Pierre started panicking, half running and partly stumbling his way back up the staircase into his study, empty, just how he'd left it before bed. No, no, surely not. He once more weighed his way down the stairs, and then again down another flight to the first floor, his hands bumping against the bottom end of the banister, where something soft caught his attention. Shining his light on it, he saw a beige frock, Marker's frock. Despite the number of coat hangers and hat stands around the house, she always opted to leave the thing atop the bottom staircase railing. Soft earth clothing was something Marker had been so reluctant to try at first. But in just a few weeks, he could see her growing used to it. He had even seen her looking into a few shop windows on their daily walks around town. Just a, a week, in, in just a week she's become so familiar, like she was always here, brightening up this old, empty house. Moving on from the landing, Pierre went into the dining room, empty like all the rest. He slumped down against the nearest chair, one of the few that had survived his Amaka's jewel back on the second day of her being in the house. This house is empty. Amaka has left. I pushed her away. I made her leave. And how empty it felt. A home large enough for twelve or more back in Balia had now returned to its single inhabitant. Pierre all by himself in those long, dark hallways, eating alone in that wide open dining room, writing and sleeping by himself on that quiet, isolated third floor. Alone. A rustling suddenly caught his attention. A sound like glass knocking against plastic. Pierre sprang to his feet and into the hallway. Walking down to its end, he turned to stand to the only door he hadn't checked, the kitchen door. And there it was. The ceiling light was off, but instead the whole room was illuminated by a brilliant white glow. Maybe not as hot and atom-melting as it had seemed when he first saw it a week ago in his study, but nonetheless a wall of white. And staring into it contentedly, Marka. Don't! His throat caught to the point where the words were little more than a rasp. Marka turned with a start of surprise at the intrusion. <laughs> Please don't go. Don't, don't leave, Pierre half mumbled, dropping to his knees as though bowing. Pierre, well, what's wrong? Why are you up so... Marka tried. Don't go. I know I have no right to ask this. I said such terrible things about you, and I, I even struck you. I had no right to do that. I will never have a right to do that. But, but please don't go. Tears streamed down his face now, 
and any semblance of his supposed manly facade melted away. I thought I'd lost it all years ago, that I was destined to be alone here on this stupid, unflared planet, trapped to sit in my room on my computer, ostracized and rejected from a society simply for being different, destined to be alone, because that's, that's just how things are. And I was okay with that, I think. Okay with just being here alone. Comfortable. Big house. Every item I could ask for. Riches galore. But Maka, in this single week with you, I have smiled more than I did in decades. Remembered feelings I thought were reserved solely for other people. Remember that I don't have to hide away in my room like some social reject for all eternity. So please! I, I know I have no right left to ask this, but don't step through that stupid portal. Maka smiled. That slightly mischievous, cunning, and most of all, always exceptionally kind smile. Then you accept me as being... No! Pierre half wailed. No! And maybe I never will. And I'm sorry for that, too. I wish with all my heart I could acknowledge you as my Arctic. I really do. But you aren't the girl I once knew. You're not some idealized made-up woman from my head. Instead, you're compulsive, cheeky, inquisitive. So very beautiful. And so much, much more human. But I, I think that's okay. Good even, because... Because you're... You are Marco Umas, my... The words faded again. They seemed so silly to say aloud. Like something he might have written into one of his stupid novels. And yet the words felt so very true. Your friend, Pierre? Marco finished for him. He nodded. With a grin, Marco put her hands to her chin as she responded. Well, I guess I could stay a little longer, a trial week perhaps, from now until Valentine's, to see if you really want me around, she said playfully. But I have a condition. Anything. The evil grin faded, and the kind smile returned to Maka's face once more. She reached out her hand to the white light of the so-called portal, and closed the fridge door. Like everything in Pierre's home, the fridge was an expensive and practical make of thing. Its interior light more than enough to partially light up the kitchen if one, say, came down to get a glass of milk in the middle of a restless night. The fridge door closed, Maka leaned down to Pierre's still crouching form and grabbed his head into her arms before embracing him fully. The embarrassment of realising the portal had just been the open fridge door faded from Pierre instantly as Maka hugged him. She was warm, so very warm. When did someone last hug me? I'll stay for the trial period. If you agree to be my valentine, Maka whispered into his ear. Pierre's face, covered still in tear-staining and stress, flushed a bright crimson red. Blushing isn't very manly either, is it? I, I still think it's for children, he mumbled. I don't care, she cooled back. Pierre nodded, finally reusing his arms and returning Maka's embrace. Then I'd be honoured to be your valentine, if you'll have me, that is.